Hello, my name is uh, Martin Kohlberger, and I'm recording this today from my home in Treaty 6 territory uh, in central Canada. And before I start my presentation, I would like to acknowledge the First Nations and Métis people who have called this home since time immemorial. Um, I am new to this area. Uh, I am very grateful and honored to have been able to move here. I have learned a lot in the last six months, but I also look forward to uh, continuing to nurture and establish new relationships with uh, especially my Indigenous colleagues and neighbors. Today I will uh, talk to you about the uh, documentation of endangered knowledge and toponymy in Ecuador and about how this has given us insight into the linguistic prehistory of the country. So um, to start with, I want to tell you a little bit about a project that I began a few years ago on Ecuadorian toponymy, a uh, uh, first step towards creating a database of Ecuadorian toponyms. Um, and then I want to take you um, to a different area, which is uh, a project on the documentation of the Shibet language, which included the documentation of Shibet toponymy. And then finally, I want to bring the two things together. I want to tell you how insights from the Shibet documentation project um, actually are feeding into this cartography um, database project of Ecuadorian toponyms. And I want to share with you some of the methodological lessons that I have um, learned throughout this time. So to begin with, Ecuadorian toponyms are largely of indigenous origin. And uh, currently the most widely spoken indigenous language in the country is Quechua, which is a Quechuan language. But most indigenous toponyms are actually not of Quechuan origin. Um, so to understand this, we have to look at a map of the major languages or language families of Ecuador. This is a rough map um, and it doesn't include all the languages of the country, but it does include the four major language families um, spoken in, in, in Ecuador. And what you'll see is that the um, Quechuan um, circles, the red circles um, are concentrated in the central highlands of the country. And then on the three river basins in the Amazonian region of, uh, of the country. And indeed, Quichua, the Quechuan language of Ecuador, is the most widely spoken indigenous language of the country. You also, however, have Barbacoan languages to the northwest, Chukanoan languages to the northeast, and Chicham languages to the southeast. But um, Quechuan languages are actually a relative newcomer to Ecuador in the sense that they um, only arrived there um, shortly before the European conquest uh, in the 1500s. And so Quechuan languages have only really been in this area for just over 500 years, um, or at least have only been in this area in force for at least 500 years. Um, and so the conjectures that people have about what the situation was beforehand is that the other language families, Barbacoan, Chicham, and Tukanoan, were more widespread. Uh, before the arrival of Quechuan. The idea is that Barbacoan languages were uh, spread throughout the central Ecuadorian highlands, um, that Tucanoan languages were more widespread in the Amazon basin, and that Chicham languages, which are currently only spoken in the Amazon basin, might have actually been spoken in the southern highlands of what is now Ecuador at one point. Um, now, the way that we arrive at these uh, conjectures is that many non-Quechuan toponyms have remained in use over the centuries. Um, so by looking at the form and distribution of the non-Quechuan toponyms, um, we are able to make some guesses about the pre-colonial linguistic landscape um, of what is now Ecuador. And uh, the, the toponymy is in a way quite insightful, but the fact that we uh, are basing a lot of these uh, um, these conjectures on toponymy alone um, is a little bit complicated. Studies in Ecuadorian toponymy have been done in the past and um, sources include colonial sources and Republican era sources. Um, the colonial sources, the most um, insightful ones in this area include Ciesa de Leon and Jimenez de la Espada, uh, for both of which there are more recent editions. And then the most important Republican era sources are Gijón y Camaño and Pazimiño, uh, both of whom were most active in the 40s. And these uh, toponymic studies 
are fascinating, but there are shortcomings to this earlier work. First of all, it is not uh, hugely informed by the knowledge of the smaller languages of the region. So the authors in many cases were familiar with the larger languages of the area, but not really uh, the small language families. And so as a result, they suggest often quite implausible etymologies, either because they are suggesting etymologies for um, languages that were maybe not spoken in a particular area, um, or sometimes blends between languages that are unlikely to have been in contact with each other. Um, and also these studies are just not informed by modern day linguistic considerations, things that we know from linguistic typology as being either likely or unlikely, um, or even our current day understanding of the grammatical structure of some of the languages spoken in modern day Ecuador. So um, because there had been no um, modern uh, large scale study of Ecuadorian toponymy, um, about four years ago, I decided to embark on a new long term project on the toponymy of the country with the goals to compile a uh, very comprehensive database of toponyms and to try to identify patterns in the data. And to use as a source, I uh, started looking at the maps of the Instituto Geográfico Militar, which is the government institution that creates maps for the Ecuadorian government. And these maps are really very detailed. They're available for all of Ecuador and they include cities, towns, villages, um, even sometimes individual hamlets, um, river names, lake names, mountain names, and sometimes even places of um, cultural interest. Um, I should point out that I'm not the only person to have had uh, a similar idea. Um, I know of other colleagues who are currently also working on the toponymy of Ecuador, um, notably uh, Simeon Floyd in Ecuador. And so this is an exciting area because there's a few of us um, who are interested in this. And I think that this will be a very um, rich area for research and for collaborations uh, in the coming years. So it's an exciting domain. Um, to give you a sense of what the um, cartography project involved. Um, this is what the, the maps look like. And so they're really quite detailed um, maps. And as you can see, see they include um, uh, really a range of geographic features as well as settlements. But it is, a ta it is a huge task because it involves having to transcribe the data from the maps. Um, and it is really a, a, a mammoth uh, task. Um, so this has proceeded very slowly. And I've not been able to embark on the, uh, on the pattern finding as much as I would have liked to um, after these years. Um, I'm still in, in, in the um, uh, phase of collecting the database through these maps. Unfortunately, it can't be digitized um, too much because although there are existing digital lists of Ecuadorian toponyms, they are not nearly as um, detailed and precise as these maps. And also because of the nature of these maps, it is hard to set up automated um, digitization where an algorithm simply transcribes all the names on the map. So it is a manual uh, labor and it is quite uh, time intensive. Now, as I have been embarking on this cartography project of uh, documenting Shiria, uh, sorry, Ecuadorian toponyms, um, over the last decade, I have also been collaborating with the Shiviad Nation, which is one of the indigenous nations um, within the Ecuadorian state. And um, the Shiviad Nation is located in eastern um, Ecuador, and there are 14 villages that make up this nation. Here's a picture of Huyuinza, one of the 14 villages, the easternmost one. And to give you a bit of context, um, the Shiviad Nation um, are the speakers of one of the Chicham languages. So there are five Chicham languages, previously known as Hivaroan languages, that are all spoken in the Ecuador-Peru border region. Um, here's a list of the five languages. They have differing number of, of, of speakers. Um, and I have worked primarily with um, members of the Shiviad Nation. So the Shibiad language documentation project began as my doctoral research project in 2011 with the aim of writing a descriptive grammar. But since that point, um, this project has really evolved into a much more general documentation project. And um, 
there's a couple of reasons for this, but um, it's important that, that we understand the situation um, of the Shibiat language, which is that Shibiat people are multilingual. That means they are speakers of the Shibiat language, um, but they also speak Spanish and um, in many cases, Quichua, Pastasa Quichua. But the main language of all the Shibiat villages is Shibiat, which means that the language is being transmitted to younger generations. And therefore there is no generalized concern within the Shibiat nation about language endangerment, given that the language is spoken virtually by the entire nation. Um, however, uh, there have been other patterns. So the fact that there has been uh, missionization in the area and a push towards integration to the broader Ecuadorian society has meant that there's been really a rapid change of lifestyle um, for members of the Shibiat nation. And many aspects of traditional knowledge are not being transmitted to younger generations. So this is an area where the community has mobilized because um, they have become aware that certain knowledge is becoming critically endangered. So that was primarily the reason why this documentation project went from being um, first and foremost a project with the goal of writing a descriptive grammar to now a project of documenting endangered cultural knowledge. So my uh, Shibuya collaborators um, thought that we should really shift the focus from just uh, what originally was looking at connected discourse, um, dialogic speech and monologues to really um, looking more at the cultural side of things. So documenting traditional prayers and incantations, uh, a genre called anin, uh, looking at the knowledge of flora and fauna, uh, in particular, um, an avoidance register used for hunting. But crucially for the topic that I'm talking about today, uh, many of my Shibir collaborators really wanted to document toponymy. So this is a project that uh, we embarked upon for a few years. And um, it involved looking at, well, first of all, compiling, I guess, uh, Shibuya place names, including village names, river names, lake names. Um, but more importantly, also documenting the knowledge that people and in particular elders had about uh, the history of these places, why they might have been called the way that they're called, so their etymologies, and also any relevant information about them. And this was really a fascinating, uh, a fascinating project because um, it was really clear that um, in particular, the older generations had quite concrete ideas about the etymologies of place names, even though these ideas have not been necessarily transmitted to younger generations um, in recent years. And so it was really a very, a very interesting uh, process. But as we documented the knowledge surrounding place names, very clear patterns began to emerge um, about you know, how Shibiat people had been naming places, rivers, and, uh, and lakes. So, well, what you see here is an example of the, of the kind of lists that were compiled uh, in addition to the documentation, the oral documentation of knowledge. Um, but here are some of the patterns that, that, that became clear. First of all, most Shibiat hydronyms are compounds with two components where the first component is most often an individual person's name um, or flora or fauna. And the second component is the word for river or for lake. So in Shibiat, Inza or Mamus. And here you see some examples. Chuininza, which would um, mean Chuin's river, Chuin being a Shibiat male name. Doming Mamus, Doming's lake. Again, Doming being a Shibiat male name. But then you also get Wambainza, which is the river of the ice cream bean, which is an edible an edible vegetable um, or plant. Uh, Mundinza, which is the um, river of Kapok. Kapok is a gigantic uh, Amazonian tree. Then you have Yandanainza, uh, the river of the smooth fronted caiman, right, an animal. And Sansamamus, the river, or sorry, the lake of the Watsin, which is a bird. So you can, you can clearly see this pattern um, of how the compounds are formed. And um, and they, they often made very um, clear sense uh, in terms of the history. So for example, um, Mimbenza was identified by elders as being a river where there's many kapok trees, um, Wambainza, a river where people went to collect ice cream bean and so on. Um, the first component also could be an adjective, an idiophone or a common noun that refers to a culturally important item. So you do have cases of uh, names like Shikyanza for small river, 
or Huyuyinza for Misty River, where Huyui is actually an idiophone. So Huyui, Huyui, Huyui means um, evaporating water. Uh, or things like Titipiur Mamus, the, spirit, the lake of the night spirit, and Tanguinza, the river of the large drinking bowls, which are an important cultural item. And this river is called this way because a community found a large pile of old um, drinking bowls that must have been left there by, by people in the past. So um, in addition to these clear patterns in the naming of hydronyms of rivers and lakes, um, you also find that there is uh, another way of naming rivers, which is by using the word for fish, namak. So you have cases um, of rivers called Nayanamak, big fish. Um, however, when you look at other Chicham languages, it becomes clear that Namak means river. Um, and it is likely that this word underwent semantic shift in Shibiat, but that really the old meaning of river remains fossilized in the hydronyms. Um, it is also noteworthy that there's a locative suffix Nama in Chicham languages, which probably originates from this noun. Um, and Villages are most often named after rivers, and they're most often contracted versions of the river names. So instead of calling the village on Chuin's river Chuininza, it's called Chuinza, a shortened contracted version. Same thing with the village on the large drinking bowl river, it's not called Tangunza, it's called Tangunza. And the river of the Piranhas is called Paninza. And um, in the contracted forms, the second component is very often lenited. So whereas the word for river is normally pronounced with a voiced affricate unza, the, um, the village names often either have a voiceless affricate tsa or simply a, a fricative sa. Finally, um, high frequency toponyms are lenited even further. So the big rivers of the area and the big settlements um, actually end in as. So you have the Babonasa River, one of the major rivers of the area is called Pupunas in Shibiat, but there's broad consensus amongst Shibiat people that the name originates in Pumbunza, so the river of the Panama hat plant. And this went from Pumbunza to Pumbunza to eventually Pupunas. And so you have this process where you end up with some of the most highly used um, hydronyms and toponyms with as ending, Pupunas, Canoas, and so on. Now, if we go back to the other project, um, the General Ecuadorian Toponymy Project. One thing um, that is noteworthy is that very little is known about the languages of the Ecuadorian highlands that were uh, spoken before the northern spread of Quechon languages. Um, and in many cases, as I've said, the only insights we have is what is available through toponymy. So if we go back to the map of Ecuador um, and we zoom into one of these languages that is documented in the colonial literature, namely a set of three perhaps dialects or three languages, Palta, Malacato, and Bracamoro, which were spoken in the uh, blue circle in southern Ecuador in the highlands. Um, for reference, the yellow circle is where Chicham languages are spoken today in the Amazon basin. Now, Palta, eh, Malacato, and Bracamoro are said to have been spoken in the southern highlands of Ecuador but only four words are documented in the colonial literature. Um, and even though no much can be said about these four words, three of them actually have been suggested as tentative Chicham uh, cognates. So you have the word for water, the word for corn, and the word for fire or burn, which um, might be Chicham cognates. Now, in 1975, Maritza Nierre also suggested that toponyms in the Palta area are reminiscent of Chicham toponyms because they end in Nama or Numa, which is evocative of the Chicham locative case marker. So you have Gonzanama, Tumbunuma, Pusanuma. Um, but actually, now that we look at the Shibiat documentation of toponyms, we know that Namak, which means fish in modern day Shibiat, but river in some of the other languages, is actually used in Shibiat hydronyms. So this lends weight to the idea that Nyerere had that these uh, Nama toponyms are reminiscent of Chicham languages. But actually it goes further. If we look at the place names in this cartography project in the Mal Palta, Malacato and Bracamoro areas, we find that many hydronyms end in as, exactly as the high frequency Shibia toponyms. Um, so Calvas, Guararas, Katanas, just like Pupunas and Canoas in Shibia. Also, many toponyms end in anga, which even though this was not found in um, the Shibia toponyms, 
the uh, meaning of anga in Chichen languages is a narrowing, and it often is used to describe a river gorge uh, or a canyon. And when you look at these toponyms, and here's four of the many that are found in the area, Ajilanga, Sosoranga, Orianga, Kisanga. If, um, if we uh, go over to uh, Google Maps and have a look at what these um, areas actually look like in terms of the, um, the geography, we find that the Anga toponyms occur in exactly geographic uh, narrowings. Um, so either gorges or canyons um, throughout this entire area. So here's the example of Sosoranga. Again, um, it's a, a kind of small canyon. And uh, the example of Kasanga is a third example of the many Anga toponyms that, um, that exist in these, in these narrowings. Um, so really, there is some weight to the idea that these might actually be uh, Chicham cognates. Furthermore, the first element is often recognizable as a cognate too. And when, when it's recognizable, it often does refer to a person, flora, fauna, or a culturally important object. So casa might be cognate to thief, um, kurich might be cognate to uh, thorny grass, numbi, mountain papaya, which is by the way, a very common fruit in this area, and uh, kariamu, uh, fermented drink. So, these similarities in toponymic patterns uh, found in the in the Palta area compared to the modern day Chicham areas are really uh, quite strong. So there's similarities in the form of the toponyms, in the semantics of the respective first and second components, and also further evidence based on the geographic distribution, like the fact that the Anga toponyms that mean narrowing in Shiviad um, actually do occur in geographic narrowings. So I think this is compelling evidence to support the claim that Palta, Malacato, and Bracamoro have actually may have been Chicham languages in the past. Now, what does this uh, tell us in more general terms? First of all, the documentation of endangered knowledge is a vital goal. And I think that this is something that we as linguists need to remember that even in cases where languages are not strictly endangered, quote unquote, in terms of number of speakers or transmission, we should be devoting time into documenting endangered traditional knowledge. Um, now, secondly, the idea that documenting knowledge surrounding toponyms actually can give us extremely rich understanding of linguistic patterns. As someone who was, or you know, at first only focused in natural speech and connected discourse, um, I might have been quite skeptical a few years ago as to the kind of linguistic patterns that might have emerged through looking at toponyms. But uh, it's very clear that that the um, insights from this project were very uh, were very fascinating. And finally, in the case of Southern Ecuador, as we have seen, through the documentation of Shibia toponymy, hundreds of kilometers away, we actually um, ended up with unexpected advances in the understanding of languages that have not been spoken for over 400 years, in the sense that uh, the evidence does seem to show that maybe Palta was um, a Chicham language. So this has been a really exciting project to work on, and I, I look forward to see what other insights we might get over the next few years and where it might go. Um, but for now, uh, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to um, hearing your comments. Um, you're welcome to write to this email address uh, for comments or questions. And, um, and I will conclude.